Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Gipco Cell Culture Heroes, 60th Anniversary Edition. And I am Susie Valdez of LabRoots, and I will be your MC for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Thermo Fisher Scientific. To learn more, you can go visit them at thermofisher.com. Now, we encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you might have during this presentation. To do so, simply type them in to the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit any technical issues here as well if you have any trouble seeing or hearing this presentation. I'd now like to introduce Kate Judd, who will be moderating today's panel. Kate, over to you. All right. Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon. This is a wonderful webinar we've got today. We're very excited to be here. My name is Kate Judd, and I've been with Gibco and Thermo Fisher for 21 years. I have a love for Gibco, so I was very happy to be a part of this. We've got some great panelists here who have some wonderful stories. I am a marketing, um, sorry, pardon me. I am a technical sales specialist manager in our cell biology business unit. And I am based in Grand Island, New York, where our Gibco site is. Um, prior to this role, I was in marketing. And prior to marketing, I was in our R&D. That culminates to 21 years here at Gibco and all parts of our, our cell biology business unit. And I'm very happy to be here. Uh, we have, first, we would like to play a recap of a couple of really cool video clips from what we've been doing this year to celebrate our 60 years of Gibco. So if we could play that video, well, thank you. It all started with a bottle and you. I came to understand how many innovations can be discovered by taking these risks and how much I could actually learn through the failures. The real skill is discovering why something isn't working and how you can get it to work. This is what drives me and what is important to me, that real life impact. Maybe my little cell cultures can have just that. Meeting a future mentor, a chance encounter at a trade show, a touching thank you email. The past six decades have been filled with your pivotal moments, turning points that have not only taken careers forward, but cell culture as a whole. For 60 years, Gibco Cell Culture has been empowering moments just like these and driving discovery. Our products have been playing their part in your ups and downs, your breakthroughs and setbacks. And now, as this anniversary year comes to a close, we stand back and take a look at just how far we've come together. Snapshot in a Bottle is a celebration of our community, our stories and our shared love for ourselves. After all, we've only reached this incredible milestone because of you. For the last 12 months, we've been writing our collective cell culture history minute by minute. We've been paying tribute to the smaller yet no less significant pieces that make up the bigger picture, your snapshots. We've heard how a relative's diagnosis shifted focus onto cancer research how a budding scientist felt the first time working with real patient cells, and how a last minute leap of faith led to a fresh start and a dream fulfilled. What do I have to lose, right? We've also brought our community together. Staging anniversary events worldwide, we invited Thermo Fisher scientific colleagues and customers past and present to come along, reminisce, and raise a toast to an extraordinary 60 years. So, here's to the history. Here's to the triumphs. From the first cultured stem cells of the 1960s to the COVID-19 vaccines of the 2020s. And here's to the millions of defining moments that have yet to shape our cell culture journey. We can't wait to see what the next chapter has in store for cell culture and you. Right, wonderful. We're very excited about those videos. We've we've done a lot this year, and one of the best parts about it is meeting scientists um, 
like you on this panel, I would like to introduce everyone. Um, Amit, if you could tell us a little bit about yourself. I'm going to put you on the spot first. <laughs> Hi. Uh, can you see me? Yeah. Yes. Sorry, the fire the fire alarm testing went off at the exact same oh, time you asked me course. to come <laughs> in our building. It's the first Wednesday of the month. But uh, hello, everybody, and uh, my name is Amit, and uh, I'm a research scientist at the University of Cincinnati. I work with Dr. Laura Conforti in the Department of Internal Medicine, and I have been a part of this lab. Uh, I started as a postdoc, then I became a research associate. Now I'm a research scientist. Uh, I have been working in this lab for the past 12 years. Uh, prior to this, I uh, did my PhD at Wright State University in uh, Physiology and uh, Cell Biology. Uh, and I was there from the years 2001 until 2000 and, uh, sorry, 2003 to 2009. And before that, I have a very interesting background. I have a degree in medicine from India. And uh, I worked for a couple of years in rural areas as a, uh, a practicing physician. But my, re my interest always uh, late in uh, basic science research. So that basically made me come to US and I have been on a journey. The focus of my research here is uh, mainly cancer research. Uh, we study uh, head and neck cancer and we are trying to study what is the, uh, we are basically trying to uh, study what is the effect of the tumor microenvironment on the immune response. And uh, for that, we use primary cell culture models and we also use the the commercially available cell culture. And for that, I have had a very long standing uh, relationship with GIPCO and I'm excited to be a part of this and I'm looking forward to talking to all of you. Thank you. Wonderful. It's great to meet you too. All right. Can I put Ernesto on the spot to go next to introduce yourself? Hi. Hi, Kate. Hi, everyone. Um, well, it's a pleasure to be here. So my name is Ernesto Galar, and I'm a postdoc research uh, associated at the University of Sao Paulo at the Human Genome and Stem Cell Research Center in Sao Paulo, Brazil. And uh, 14 years ago, I unfortunately uh, lost my uncle due to um, a liver disease. And since then, I decided to dedicate my entire scientific career trying to develop new approaches to address this very uh, relevant uh, issue that is organ shortage for transplantation. Uh, on the beginning of my scientific career, I went to US at Temple University, the part of bioengineering, working with Dr. Peter Lelkes. And since then, I started to uh, develop several works with cell culture, especially with liver tissue engineering. And then I moved back to Brazil uh, to do my PhD and uh, most recently uh, engaged with this uh, postdoc uh, research project in which I shift a little bit the, the strategy that I've been using so far towards uh, a genetic engineering approach trying to make universal cell donors from stem cells and also uh, the same idea but for xenotransplantation, which is we are genetically engineering pigs to make their organs compatible with a human transplant. So yeah, that's it. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Nice. Getting rid of that wait list, right? Or the waiting time. I love it. Um, all right. And Rukia, we'll put you on the spot now to introduce yourself. Hello, good morning or good afternoon from where everyone is visiting. My name is Rukia Henry, and I am currently a PhD candidate at Rutgers University. But before coming here, I attended Harvard University, and that is where my research um, interest began budding. Um, I conducted a lot of neurovirology research looking at the pathogenesis of viral infections and how it can impact the brain development. And then around my senior year, my mom was diagnosed with breast cancer. And so I decided to go to graduate school and pursue a degree in cancer pharmacology. And so currently I work in the lab of Dr. Sridhar Ganesan. And my work entails a lot of cell culture, which is why I was 
first introduced to GIPCO. Um, one of my projects looks at the way proteins are involved in the DNA damage response and how the deregulation of those proteins um, can cause cancer. Another project that I work on looks at breast cancer and why some patients do not respond to chemotherapy. And so we're trying to find the markers that basically show chemo-resistant breast cancers and how we can overcome that. Um, and so I am really happy to be collaborating with GIBCO because in the lab, I do a lot of cell culture and use a lot of their resources. So it's been a great pleasure to collaborate and to be here today. We're so happy to have you. Thank you. All right. So if we have everyone visible, we've got a panel session. Uh, I do want to call out Jessica Hess, unfortunately was unable to make it today due to illness. So we, we do miss her, but we do have some great questions for the three panelists. I will go around. Um, the first question I would love to ask, can you have um, one adjective that you would use to describe Gibco? So Amit, do you have one word, one adjective? Sorry. It's okay. I don't know exactly if it's an adjective, but the one word that always comes to my mind is supportive. Like whatever I needed, whatever I wanted, Gipco has always been there for me. And sometimes for difficult models, uh, Gipco has always helped me with excellent tech support. They have provided me with samples to try new things. And whatever questions I had, they always replied to me. So it just made the whole process uh, so easy for me. So I would say supportive, support system. It's my support system and supportive. All right, good one. All right, Ernesto, one word for you, if it's possible, one word. Well, uh, yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's a tricky one, but uh, I will go with excellency. I, I think in a more broader sense of it, uh, like Ahmed said, uh, this, the tech support is, is fantastic, but also the quality of the products and services that Gibco provides. So it's basically excellency in a 360 degrees manner of speaking, yeah. Nice. All right, and Rukia, how about you? You know, my word is the same as Amit. Um, the first thing that I think of when I hear Gipco is supportive. And I think because most of my research is on cell culture. So whenever I needed resources, of course, Gipco is always the brand that we go for. If I have questions or troubleshooting similar to his experience, the technical support is always there ready to answer questions, walk me through um, the troubleshooting experience. And then even their support throughout my PhD journey and helping to create even this network and this opportunity. Um, I think there's support for none. That's wonderful to hear because we, we pride ourselves on support. It's wonderful to hear that. Um, all right, so we've got another question. I'm going to ask you, Rukia, first. Describe the moment you realized the importance of cell culture in your own research experience. For example, was it your first cell culture experiment or a discovery at the lab? What was that moment you realized? I think for me, it was when I started making um, cell lines from patient tumors. And I realized the value in what I was doing and the fact that I can take um, tissue that came from a patient's breast who had breast cancer and then through a process make that into a cell line where I can look at that under a microscope and then do um, more, exp more experiments to figure out what exactly is driving this cancer. Um, I think that was the defining moment because of course it's, such a great opportunity for exploration um and you're able to get answers to questions that you might not have in the moment and then you're able to create therapies for these patients um and so i think that was a real defining moment where the work that i was doing was directly translational um and cell culture was helping me to accomplish this a wonderful feeling yeah Okay, Ernesto, how about you, your moment? 
Well, I think uh, my defining moment was um, when I was starting my training on tissue engineering at Temple University. And then I was trying to, to understand how could I uh, produce a human liver in the laboratory. So to do that, of course, we need cells. So at the time, I did not have any training on cell culture. So my first experiment with uh, uh, cell culture was with primary human fibroblasts, very basic uh, cell culture. And this was very interesting for me coming from a pharmaceutical background to see the cells growing and the potential that those cells have to, uh, to differentiate, to, to grow, and possibly in the near future to uh, generate a, a fully functional human organ or tissue. That was the defining moment for me. Yeah, and then to see it in real life too, under a scope too. I remember that same feeling, it, this is, it's right here, it's tangible. Okay, Amit, how about you? What about your defining moment? Uh, I started cell culture in very simpler times. Uh, basically, my uh, project during my PhD was to look at the lens epithelial cells, and we had a lens epithelial cell line. And my thing was to just expose that to UV radiation and different pro-apoptotic stimulus and look at the mechanism of apoptosis. So my project was basically to try to kill cells. And I was trying different methods to kill the cells, you know, and looking at the apoptotic assays. So in order to look at large throughput, it was so amazing to discover the immortalized cell lines in which you could just grow them in uh, 24 well plates or 96 well plates. You can do different treatments and you can get a lot of, uh, like you can answer a lot of questions at once. You know, you can do a dose response, you can do time response. So it was a revelation for me that, okay, this makes things so much easier to find answers to your question. Then when I joined my postdoc, we, uh, uh, I switched to cancer research and uh, started studying the immune cells. And we started isolating immune cells from uh, cancer patients uh, or healthy donors, you know. And so I, I had to maintain them in cell culture. And then uh, slowly we progressed to growing uh, two-dimensional and sorry, three-dimensional models from uh, primary tumors you know we grew them into spheroids and organoids so that was again an experience so cell culture is very has been very indispensable for me i mean i cannot separate cell culture from my actual research i mean they just are a part and parcel and an integral part so it's just been uh, at the forefront of whatever i do cell culture so love it love it all right, I'm going to stay with you, Amit, for the next question. Name one discovery that you would hope cell culture research can uncover in the next decade. Just one, uh, again. Definitely. Uh, over the past, just one. Uh, I think it would uh, mainly be to create a, a model to study generalized all kinds of cancers basically like an artificial model which would be characteristic or have some kind of a characteristic of different type of cancers that can be studied in one model system where you can apply a lot of techniques and you can provide answers that's what i think that's a good one yeah and i know because cancer is so I, and I know you all have this experience too. It's just, it's so many different things. It's not just one disease, right? So you can pick and choose pieces or, or types, right? But um, that ultimate goal to hit, to hit all of the types. All right, uh, Ernesto, how about you? One discovery, and I was being funny. You could have more than one, but your top choice, I guess, your one discovery that you'd hope comes in, in a decade. Well, I... I really have high hopes that um, with the recent developments on genetic engineering side, combining with advanced cell culture techniques, we'll be able in the next 10 years to generate uh, genetic engineer cell lines that could potentially overcome uh, the deficits of organ uh, donors and tissue donors to make them compatible universally throughout the human population. And it's a very diverse genetic background. So that's something that I can, I believe it's, it's accomplishable in the next 10 years. All right. And Rukia, how about you? Well, my thing, 
maybe personal to my project, a model to study the mechanism of resistance um, to cancer therapies. Because as much as we try to uncover the mechanisms that might drive cancer, um, when you do treatments, a lot of times these cells can evade it. So if we have a model that can maybe predict what that evasion mechanism could be in real time, it would make you know cancer research and drug discovery so much easier. And, and also how different it is from human to human, right? And we know it's not going to be the same across the board. So what are those differences too? What are the leading the causes of those differences too. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. All right. So hey Kate, you know, uh, also something yeah. on a please I have another thing, you know, on a lighter <laughs> on a lighter note. Uh have you seen recent reports that uh, they have grown a salmon in cell culture? Like salmon meat they grew in cell yeah. culture in a petri oh, yeah. dish. So I think so what about in the next 10 years if your entire Thanksgiving meal is grown with cell culture? <laughs> because they are now discovering that this is a more sustainable form of meat, you know, to grow the cells in cell culture. And uh, they are reporting that it has the exact same taste and, you know, same thing, but just very, very sustainable form of meat. So who knows what will happen in 10 years? I do know, too, there was... Uh, conferences we've been involved with recently this year with cultured meat and cultured general protein, and they had cultured caviar mm -hmm. to taste at this conference Ooh. too. So yes, I see it's coming. It's going. Um, and it's a huge piece. It's right for sustainable food products. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we, we focus mainly on disease and everything, but also for sustainable, healthy living in the next few years, cell culture is going to have a very important role, I think. Yeah, I agree with you. Absolutely. Okay, let's go to my questions list two. So we've got another one. Um, Ernesto. Well, actually, all of you are in a different phase in your in your career. We know this. Um, and, it, and it's great to have such a wide array of panelists here. But um, in your journey as career scientists, what do you feel are your career aspirations for 10 years from now for yourself? So not what the world can do like as a whole, but what, what do you want to be doing in 10 years? Well, I, I, I do hope that it's still doing some uh, uh, very like uh, cutting edge technology on the, on the field on transplantation. So basically, uh, still on the scientific um, uh, branch of work uh, in academia or industry, I do not have any preference, uh, but um, as long as I'm doing like very cutting edge uh, science and technology. So if I'm doing this, I'm happy. Yeah. That's a good way to be. Oh, yeah. How about you, Rukia, for the next 10 years or longer? <laughs> take over the world. Um, I have been thinking a lot about that recently because I'm in that phase of finishing up my PhD and, you know, planning my next career trajectory. Um, and so I think for myself, because I currently work on a clinical trial, I would want to be in a position where I take the work we do in cell culture and directly take that to the patients. So of course, in cancer research, um, the basic science that we do is to find you know, the mechanisms that might drive the cancer. And so I would potentially want to be, I guess, say a project manager for a breast cancer clinical trial. Um, using new cutting edge resources and technology that can, you know, help us to find what these mechanisms are and to treat the patients in real time. Um, I think I also want in that sphere increased diversity and representation in clinical trials um, so that everyone benefits from the research that we're doing. Um, I think I also want to open a mentorship program alongside that to encourage other young women to get into STEM, um, train them in cell culture, train them how to do science, and just encourage them to, you know, get into this field because we have to make space as we move along for the upcoming generation. Yeah, I love that. I love that. So in a, in a little bit of a different way to look at it, if you could look back at your 
self 10 years ago and look at where you are now, do you feel you are in the spot you expected yourself to be in? Is it better, worse, or exactly what you thought? I'm going to stick with you, Rukia. What do you think? You, Absolutely 10 years ago. not. <laughs> <laughs> um, my plan, so I grew up in Guyana. And I think coming from there, the two careers that your parents always push on you is you either be a lawyer or a medical doctor. So growing up, I had no idea what a scientist was. I mean, I took science courses and I was taught by teachers, but a scientist, I had no idea what that was. Um, and so looking back, no, I would have never imagined myself here. It's not until I came to the US and I attended undergrad that I worked in a research lab and I saw, okay, I can do science and my interest and curiosity for the way life works can actually be made into a career. Um, and so even while I was an undergrad, I was applying to medical schools. I had taken the MCAT course. I had even submitted my primary applications to medical school. And then after I completed a internship, I said, you know what, I think I want to be at the forefront of creating knowledge and not just applying it in the clinic. And so in that moment, I withdrew my applications and then I submitted applications to grad school. And so here I am, who would have thought? <laughs> <laughs> and that's a great step too. It, it, it is a world of difference to be creating your new, I mean, you're answering your own hypotheses, right? Then you have the opportunity to do that and go explore um, what you have questions about that have maybe affected your personal life too. I know you have, you have those in your history. Of, I, I mean, in your snapshot in a bottle, you've talked about that in your mom. And so it, I know it means a lot to you. So it's, it's wonderful to hear that. Yes, absolutely. Because I think um, the whole purpose of going to, you know, medical school is because I wanted to help patients like my mother. But then I realized that even if I did want to help them, there was still a lag in the amount of help I can give because they're, we first have to make the discovery of what is happening in those patients and then create a therapy to give to them. And then when I had met with an actual oncologist, you know, he told me, you know, sadly, your mother's stage, there isn't much that could be done, but through research and scientific discovery, we can make headway. And I think that was my defining moment of realizing the importance of research. Yeah, it's a very motivational, meaningful story that you have. Thank you for sharing that. Okay, Amit, I'm putting you on the spot. What about you? If you look back 10 years, are you where you imagine okay. you? <laughs> so, so, so basically, you know, I started with this with the typical, uh, you know, like how 90% of the people approach it. I'm going to do a PhD, then I'm going to do a postdoc for a few years, and then I will get the experience, I will join the industry, then I will uh, mint money and live in a big mansion, you know. So this is basically how everybody thinks, how everybody, you know, like has some kind of an aspiration, you know. But, you know, what surprised me the most is uh, when I uh, finished my PhD and uh, while my PhD and during my postdoc and all this research career, I discovered how much joy it is to make discoveries and to troubleshoot things. And apart from that, one of my biggest joys has been uh, to be a part of a teaching institution in which I got to mentor a lot of undergraduate students, a lot of medical students from very diverse countries, very diverse backgrounds, you know, underrepresented minorities, and to inculcate in them somewhere a love for science and the love for discovery, you know that uh, you, how to ask questions how to approach them how to design experiments so you know working in a lab is no longer a stepping stone to go to med school you know for several of the students you know but to seriously consider science as a form of career because we need more scientists we need more scientific funding and we need a bigger scientific infrastructure to truly make difference in the healthcare world to understand diseases to develop new treatments so this is something that has been an eye-opener for me in the past 10 years. So I would say it has been a very satisfying experience. And in certain aspects, it has totally exceeded what my expectations were. And I have never been happier to be a part of this. 
Oh, that's that's awesome. That's even better that it's it exceeded expectations. That's wonderful to hear. And Ernesto, how about you? Ten years back, looking forward to today. <laughs> well, well, I was listening to to Rukia, and uh, I I could see myself uh, ten years uh, uh, ago because I was in the in a very uh, defining moment for me to deciding whether or not should I pursue this. Uh, the scientific career, and then uh, trying to find uh, a spot for me to perform uh, and doing the scientist the science that I wanted to develop, and uh, having to make a decision to go back to my country, and decided to do this uh, this um, development of my career in my home country. So, so this is very satisfying for me to to see uh, uh, this story from Rukia. And um, and I mean, for now, I think I think I can say that I am where I was planning to be where uh, 10 years uh, ago, but it was not a straight line. It was a very like a roller coaster experience. You know, we have to be very resilient as scientists. It's uh, it's not a very like um, uh, homogeneous experience, but as for me. It's a, it's a very satisfying uh, overall uh, career. I mean, like Ahmed said, uh, we are passionate about the discovery. We are passionate about the unknown. So we are, want to expand the knowledge of human, uh, 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 from the frontiers of human knowledge. So this is very uh, challenging. So this is very inspiring, but it's not, it's not easy. It's a, it, take, it takes a lot of us. It takes a lot of a sacrifice resilience to go there. It's true. It's true. That's really that. It, it's inspiring to hear because you you've all not. I'll just put it this way. I I grew up in the United States in Buffalo, New York, and this is where I still live. And it's nice that there's a global view on this panel as well. Too. I don't I don't have that global view as well as you all do, and so it's um it's really nice to to hear those those thoughts. So you you imagine one way it's going to be, and then it's. There's changes in roller coasters, and I think that happens to all of us. Uh, it certainly happened to me as well. So thank you for that. Um, I am going to add on another couple of questions too. I'm I'm curious now that we've been chatting. Do you find that there is a general shared knowledge that is accessible in your field of research? Do you think that there is something that needs to be built as a better way? to share and expand knowledge of things that are going on. I know we have published papers and journals and things like that, but is there something that you use or something you wish we had in the world um, to share information and research? Anything outside of what already exists today? That's open for anyone, because I don't want to put anyone on the spot. This is a, a curious question for me. Um. If I can answer that from my understanding, I think maybe not in the sense of between researchers, but the access mm -hmm. between researchers and the public, because okay. the science that we do is not, is not just for ourselves. You know, we do this to help the people in the public and everyone. And I think, you know, even for myself, when I think about it, um, sometimes I get, you know, a lot of questions from my own family about plants and research, and then there's so much misinformation that they tell me, and I'm like, no, not exactly. So I wish there was a way that scientists as a whole made, that we made our work much more accessible to the public in a way that's easy for them to understand. Um, and to also break down the barriers of some of the distrust that maybe some communities have about science. Because we saw that with COVID, you know, the mistrust of the public with the COVID vaccines and everything. And I think in a way, as we do the science, we need to immediately make it more accessible and understandable for public consumption. I think that's a great, that is a very great point. And you're right, through COVID too, there was a lot of information spread um, and scientists speaking to non-scientists, let's just put it that way in the easiest way. And it, and it is, I got a lot of questions from family members too. Um, and the same kind of thing, it was just words spoken that weren't quite understood what it means or the implications of, of vaccines and things like that. And so it's a, it's a great point to share it. And maybe there's something Thermo can do to help with that too. 
So we appreciate that feedback. We do have a question from the audience. I will read it. Um, networking and, oh, unless, I'm sorry, unless Ernesto and Amit wanted to say anything more about that. I didn't mean to skip over you. Did you, if you, if you wanted to add to that last question? Ernesto, go ahead. No, right. I, I think uh, well, uh, I, I had to... it was uh, spot oh. on. And, uh, okay. Yes. <laughs> sorry, I think we have a little a little delay. Sorry for that. And uh, but mm -hmm. I, I, I just want to say that Ruka was very spot on on the um, science education. I think we need to improve our communication to broader society to avoid uh, misguidance, especially in terms of uh, policy making and uh in, in a broader sense of population education i think we have to uh i think COVID shows us that we have to uh pursue this path in a more uh, uh in a better way let's say let's put it that and uh not in terms of communication but i think in the um, uh, representation as well i think science needs, needs more representative representativity not only on the career side but also on data as well uh, i mean we have like a, a lot of technology a lot of money being put on on very cutting edge genetic uh, studies and, and uh, therapy studies but uh the representation of it is very limited to 12 countries and in, in not for developing countries and this is very Excludes, excludent in terms of uh, health and, and future approaches to treat human diseases. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I think uh, uh, Ruki and Ernesto both made excellent points. And uh, I want to add just one more thing, like as important as science communication is to uh, convey the facts to the lay population, through different platforms. I think it is also important that in the scientific community also, they make some of the studies, some of the papers easier to understand. Like in the past few years, they have papers with so much data, so much figures crammed in it, that it's almost impossible to understand, you know, what's the take home message of this paper. So maybe there needs to be some kind of a communication that would simplify the way the data is represented like i am uh, from the cancer field you know so sometimes infectious diseases or very uh, you know uh, neurosurgery or neurology or something i don't understand those things so but it should be easy that you know when i am reading a paper like if i am writing a paper someone who's not from my field should also be able to understand them so this this kind of communication also matters and the second important thing is uh accessibility because people there are scientific researchers scientific community in the different parts of the world and the world is shrinking now as uh, technology is growing so i think there should be more open access and there should be more accessibility you know like paying all these crazy subscription fees you know for journals <laughs> Someone in developing country will not have the access to that. So it's, yeah. there should be an equitable distribution that everybody can access scientific information in a, a proper and fair way. So yeah. that's what I think. Yeah, I totally agree. Thank you for that. Okay, we've got a couple questions in the chat. I will I'll read the first one. Is there anything that you really wish you could do today with your current research, but are limited by available technology and tools. For example, what is the specific capability you wish that you had that would accelerate your research right now that maybe you don't have available technology and tools for? Maybe your dream tool or technology that would that would enhance your research that you don't have. Anybody, it's open to anybody. Is it an instrument or some software that does math for you? <laughs> well, I, I think it, it's it's a, it's a very hard question. Uh, I'm sorry, Huka. I have the I have I don't know why, but I have this delay. Sorry for for jumping. In. But uh, I think this is a a very tricky question because every time that I dream or we 
it will be interesting if we have this technology on the very next day, there's a paper published on nature and also one showing the same thing. So the, the science is evolving so fast on this. So uh, for me, it's very hard to say this because all the tools that I, I, I wish we had uh, for like five years ago, we already have. So this is a, is a fantastic time to be a scientist in, the, in our field. <laughs> Right. Um, when I think about my Ooh, own, research, I want to. Uh oh. oh. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, Rukia. Okay. Um, one of the things now that I'm trying to do with my research is a type of technology called long-range sequencing, and so a few companies offer this, but the issue is because it's so new, there aren't a lot of platforms and programs to actually analyze this. And so in a way, it's more so if you think about like Illumina and like regular sequencing. So when a patient comes into the clinic, you try to sequence their genome um, and then you try to find the markers or mutations that that patient might have. Um, but there were certain limitations with that type of sequencing because in the clinic, what we have found is that a lot of the drivers um, for certain cancers are in the portions of DNA that the current technology would toss away in the introns and exons. So there are certain junctions that they may not include. And so there is a new technology, long range sequencing, that we're now trying to do on patient samples. And I have done that, but I just have the data sitting there because, of course, I'm not a computational biologist, so I have no idea how to analyze this data. Um, there isn't much on the Internet um, or in the scientific world that does human patients um, with this type of sequencing. So I think in the future, the technology that I think would be helpful is a platform where you can analyze this quickly. Um, and then more technology to better analyze the entire D I mean, genome or DNA of patients that will not miss these alterations or mutations. And I'm sure you're not alone in that. All right, Ami, you had something to say too, right? Yes. Uh, recently, um, I, I did experiments using the NanoString platform, and I was flabbergasted i had so many genes and all big data waiting and i didn't know how to do the analysis i had no access to r programming because it was not a thing back in the day so we had to track down bioinformaticians statistician and then basically learn on the job you know how to do it and make sense out of what data i had so i think as time goes by i think it would be nice to have access to better bioinformatics tools on a serious note, because now, like, you know, it's everything is RNA seq and, you know, all the big data analysis. So uh, I hope there are like simpler tools for everyone to have. So I hope that's what we will have in the future. And on a lighter note, I think science makes the progress to have a robot that can do the lab dishes. <laughs> the dishes, not the culturing, <laughs> the dishes. Got it. <laughs> the dishes. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to say the culturing. The passaging, oh, no, no, no. Which, might, which might not be actually out of the out of sight. Pretty soon, we might have that. All right, thank you. There's there's a couple more questions. Uh, this one: networking and collaboration are drivers of discovery in scientific fields. What partnership have you uncovered that was particularly helpful to you, or what type of collaboration partnership are you looking for in the future? Uh, I will go with Ernesto. Well, um, despite the classic strategy for collaboration in uh, science, where you can look out for um, colleagues of yours, of yours working with different fields and different skills that are complementary to the, the question they're trying to answer, I found myself in the past years uh, very uh, well, well suited with collaborations and partnership with the industry and especially with the startups and also big companies as well because uh, those small companies, they, they drive their, their business through very innovative approaches and technologies, and they, they need to test those technologies in, in, a, in a very um, unique setup of research and its experimentation. So I think this is um, 
I think there's a, a, a boom of startups in the field. And I think this, uh, this approach to uh, try to make collaborations with of these players in the market, I think this has been ha very helpful for me re most recently. Yeah, very good. Rukia, Ami, either one of you want to add? Uh, yes. I think uh, collaborations are and networking, it's very, very important because, uh, you know, sometimes you have some kind of experimental idea in your head, but you don't know how to go about it. And then you go to a conference, you go to a meeting and, uh, you know, you might see a talk or you might go and see a vendor and you will say, oh, hey, this is something I can use. And I go to, uh, I go to the American Association for Immunology meeting every year and I come back with my head filled with like thousand different ideas on how I can approach things. So that kind of networking that goes on in conferences or meetings or something that you learn through webinars, that is very, very important because uh, you have to keep an open mind. The question or the experiment that you want to do is the most important thing. The technique is just a tool and the techniques, how to go about it, you can achieve by proper networking or just going about your institution or asking questions and um, in in my career i have met people who have been kind enough to help me out and i have learned so many new things and uh, answered all the scientific questions i had thanks to networking and collaboration so there can be no science without collaboration and collaboration is a very integral part of science that's what i think absolutely i totally agree Mukia, do you want to add anything to that? Um, in terms of collaboration, I think, you know, it has in the beginning driven my progress in my PhD, um, especially if, you know, as a person, I can't do everything. And so handing off maybe a side project or an experiment to someone has been helpful. Um, in the future, however, one of the things that I'm mostly looking for is collaboration collaborating with maybe even committees where I am able to play a role in increasing diversity in clinical trials. Because, you know, as I mentioned before, um, the work that we do in the lab and our cell culture, a lot of it we hope is translational to saving real lives. Um, and there is a huge deficit in the diversity of patient trials. And so one of of the things I hope to collaborate with, or even with companies, you know, um, going out into the community where we, one, educate the public, and then to make it, make sure that they trust us in a way where they have the faith to participate in these clinical trials for cancer discovery that we're doing. I love it. I sense a really nice theme coming from you. All right, we've got another question. Um, and I'm going to start with you, um, uh, Ruika, because this was, it's about a PhD. So it says, how does cell culture research differ for those who do not have a PhD and those who do? For example, masters will allow more technical learning while a PhD opens a gateway to research. Do you feel there's a difference there? How does cell culture research difference between PhD and non-PhD researchers? Um, I don't... That's kind of an open-ended question because it depends on what field you're in. If I can think about it, there are a few students who do um, pursue masters um, who are exposed to cell culture work, um, but maybe in a way the technical part can come into, you know, in a PhD, a lot of times you're responsible for creating the knowledge and taking charge of your own project. Whereas maybe in a master's, it's more guided and you have a strict um, path to follow. So that's the only difference that I can think of. But for those students who might not have a PhD, as in no master's or anything at all, maybe they don't have access to cell culture, if I'm understanding the question correctly. Um, but there are a few master's students who I know are engaged in cell culture. I've trained a, a few of them in my lab. Um, so I don't think there is a vast difference. The only thing would come in project management and driving your own research as a PhD where you're much more independent versus a master's or maybe even a bachelor's where 
you're maybe told exactly what to do. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, and me, Ernesto. Oh, yep. All I, right. I want to say, yep. <laughs> yes, I have a lot to say on that actually. So there is no 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 difference between a PhD and a master student or even an undergrad. When you work in a lab, you are either a good pair of hands technically or a bad pair of hands. I have seen uh, people who are PhD or postdocs or something who are horrible at cell culture, cannot maintain anything to save their lives. And there are lab techs and there are undergrads who are excellent at it. You know, so it, it all depends on how you are as a person and your own skills. Uh, education and all, this is, cell culture is something that is learned through experience, that someone teaches you how you imbibe it, and it is a very, very technical thing. How good is your technique? So this is a level playing field irrespective of your degree. You are as good as what you learn and how you implement your learning in, in, on the lab bench. All right. I love the way you look at that. That's yeah. I just I just want to, yeah. Add, to, to yeah. I just want to add that to, to what Ahmed said. The degree uh, matters the least on this subject. It's what we like in pilots in airplane pilots is the time of flight. It's how much time and, and training have you put in to to use your skills in our in our in our field. Not time of flight, but time in culturehood. So how much time you spent there and the success you have. We'll build upon that. I'd love to think about it that way. Yep, because we've got we've got folks coming from all sorts of backgrounds and all sorts of levels of experience too. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, culture, yeah. We meet them all the time. Cool. Our, our, yeah, go well, please, go ahead. I I have a very interesting anecdote. Okay, if I want, if I may share for a couple please. of days, a couple yes. of minutes. Sorry, uh, I have a very very non orthodox method like. Uh, people will ask, how did you learn cell culture? I have a very, very non-orthodox way how I learned cell culture, okay? So when I had joined the lab, I had never even pipetted anything. And um, I had a, uh, so in PhD, you know, you had to do lab rotation in different labs and everything. So I went and I did a lab rotation. So in that lab rotation, actually the master student was my friend from India. And she was like a no-nonsense person, you know, and she was very experienced in cell culture and everything. So I had to grow cells, okay? And I would be like, she would be like, no, you have to do this slowly. She was very strict with me. So I remember I used to be in the hood and she used to sit on one of those high chairs next to me. And uh, in cell culture, you know, in the liquid nitrogen, you have this big foot ruler that you have for measuring the liquid nitrogen levels. So she would take that and she would keep it next to me, okay? So if I did anything bad, she would poke me with it. Like, you do not touch this, you do not do that, you know? So she would poke me with that stick. And then I knew what not to do, but it was very funny and we were friends and, you know, she was doing this out of humor, but her constant yelling taught me how, what not to do in cell culture. And, you know, this is how I learned how to do proper cell culture technique. Well, it's good. There's not a <laughs> lot of, poke with the stick. There, there's a lot of stuff that you're not allowed to do in cell culture. It's very true. <laughs> All right, uh, we have no further questions. I wonder if any of you three have any last comments you'd like to share before we close out? If not, I have some, but if anyone wanted to share anything, anything more? I want to say one thing. Okay. Uh, most likely an experiment, uh, most likely an experiment rather than it working the way you want it to, it will not work the way you want it to. So have faith in yourself, have faith in your work, and keep trying and troubleshoot, and ultimately you will succeed. So never lose hope. And it's it's very true because a failed experiment till still teaches you a whole lot, right? So we really appreciate uh, all three of you being on today. We appreciate your time, your experience, and sharing it with us. We've talked about a lot of things, even where we were ten years ago, where we want to be in. 10 years and how we compare and the, the need for bringing science out to the community, to everyone in the world, that the world is getting smaller and the sharing is very important. So we appreciate all of that. And I think with that, we'll bring it over to Susie to close us out. Well, I also want to thank all of you panelists for your time today and for your important research. And I'd also like to thank Labroots and our sponsor, Thermo Fisher Scientific for underwriting today's webcast. 
Before we go, I want to thank our audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions, questions we did not have time for today, and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by our speaker via the information you provided at the time of registration. And this webcast can be viewed on demand. LabRoots will alert you via, via email um, when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, take care everyone. And thank you again to all of you. Thank you for having me.